This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by OWC, Whisper Room, Eventide Audio, Spectra 1964, and Roswell Pro Audio. So get ready to rock. Imposter syndrome is the overwhelming fear that at some point someone's going to turn to you and point at you and say, you don't know what you're doing, do you? And then you're like, oh my God, they finally found me out. No, I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm faking all of this. It's pretty much the feeling that every creative has all of the time. It's six steps. This is awesome. This is tricky. This is shit. I am shit. This might be okay. This is awesome. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. This episode is sponsored by OWC, Otherworld Computing, which you can find at OWC.com, your trusted source for memory and speed upgrades, DIY installs, and used Macs for your studio. Let OWC focus on keeping your studio Mac in killer condition so that you can focus on making great music. Why ditch your existing Mac when you can take your studio far into the future with OWC? Learn more at OWC.com and learn how you can supercharge your studio Mac. The speed to create, the capacity to dream. Find out how awesome your Mac can be at OWC. The Spectra 1964 101 amplifier provides unequaled headroom, low noise, and a linear output, irrespective of transient audio peaks. In the studio, this means that critical details from your microphone get through to your DAW. The 101 was used by Tom Dowd, Muscle Shoals, Stack Studios, and The Record Plant on records by ZZ Top, Aerosmith, Bruce Springsteen, and John Lennon. Today, Spectra 1964 brings that same incredible sound to your studio with the STX100 mic pre. Learn more at Spectra 1964. What do Michael Brower, Joe Ciccarelli, Dave Pensato, and George Massenberg all have in common? They all have great things to say about Eventide. Originating in a New York City basement in 1971 with the original Instant Phaser and H910 Harmonizer, Eventide continues to transform the sound of music with the iconic H9000 Harmonizer, visionary guitar effects like the H9 pedal, and now a whole suite of incredible plugins for your studio. Go to eventide.com to learn more or click the link in the show notes below. If you're sick of bothering the neighbors when you are trying to record your music or ruining your recordings with outside noises, but you're not ready to spend a ton of money on permanent studio construction yet, then consider getting a Whisper Room ISO booth for your studio. Whisper Room offers the instant solution for a comfortable, quiet, ventilated, portable ISO booth with easy line of sight for recording vocals, guitar amps, or even drums. Get 10% off the 4x4 or 4x6 booth when you mention recording studio rock stars. Go to whisperroom.com or click the link in the show notes below. Hey, rock stars, it's your host, Lid Sean. Welcome back to Recording Studio Rock Stars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is F. Reed Shippen, a multi Grammy award winning mixer, engineer, and record producer whose credits include 10 Grammy award winning albums and over 100 number one singles. His years of experience as a recording and mix engineer span multiple genres and feature a wide range of artists such as Ingrid Michelson, Kenny Chesney, India Ari, Cage the Elephant, Little Big Town, CC Winans, Steven Tyler, Colony House, Lucy Silvas, and Dirks Bentley. In 2019, Shippen received the Academy of Country Music Award for Audio Engineer of the Year. Congrats Bizarrely. on that, dude. Bizarrely. <laughs> <laughs> He has previously served as co-chair of the producer and the engineer's wing of Neris and currently serves as the chief creative officer for the music production house, The Music Playground. An advocate for music education, Reed co-teaches a class at Middle Tennessee State University, our alma mater, dude, mm -hmm. and is co-founder of songfarm.org, giving kids equal access to creativity by building free recording studios in underprivileged high schools nationwide. Yep. He currently works out of his private Robot Lemon studio located in the Green Hills area of Nashville. Reed has been a guest on the podcast before for episode 19, early on. 
where we talked more about his background. So go check that one out if you want to learn more about where he came from. Today, we're going to take a chance to dig into talking about mixing and mixing. geeking out on what we can learn about making better records in our studios. So please welcome back F. Reed <laughs> Shippen, Recording Studio Rockstars F. Or Reed. You, call I, you know, I called you F at the first. Back in the day, it was F. It yeah. was F, man. I think that was John Hill. Was it? Yeah. It was pretty good, man. Other one one's good. Yeah, he called me F. I went I went by that for a while, but So you ready to rock? There's I am ready to rock. <laughs> Are and you there's probably to rock? there's probably credits out there somewhere where it just says mixed by F, which means they've been lost into the database of whatever. No doubt, dude. My credits, I never really got any of that straight. So things like all music guide were like all useless yeah. for my credits. Well, you know. There are people that are working on that now, so that's good yeah. news. Working on it so that you don't ever have to work on it, even retroactively? or Yeah, I'm, I'm actually, I've been doing a little consulting with a couple of companies who are doing like credits and trying to get them to figure out that like the best way to do credits is to make sure that everybody who's doing the work yeah. like is kind of looking after their own credits. And when you get everybody looking after their own credits, the truth you know, the actual accurate truth actually seems to happen. It's kind of like Wikipedia, right? Right, exactly. So, yeah, there's a couple people, um, including Viva, that are working on some really great solutions for that. And uh, I really look forward to the, to, to the day when you're listening to something on Spotify and you can click next to it and you get the full credit list. In my imagination, there's going to be future tech where um, just the act of working on something, you know, recording something automatically sort of embeds your credit and something. We too. can geek out on that. You know what the problem with that is 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 um, if you think about the way we do recording, everything compounds on everything else. Yeah. So if there's a little bit of noise on a mic pre, it's no big deal, right? When you record 200 tracks with a little bit of noise, it starts to become a big deal, and that's the that's the challenge that we're starting to run into with any kind of watermarking or any kind of music genomics. Like they they after the music gets compounded, it gets really really difficult to track all those changes all the way. Yeah, through. I can imagine. Well, hopefully um, AI robots will be able to do it for us at some yeah. point. Well, they'll be able to make the music and we can just have Mai Tais on <laughs> the beach. We can just sit back and have Mai Tais. <laughs> or just, we'll just listen to classic records. Totally. Awesome, dude. Well, so tell us um, tell us what's new in your world these days. Man, uh, new? I don't know what's new. I mean, there's a lot of, just a lot of work, you know, going on. Trying to keep a couple of balls in the air. Yeah. Um, doing the producing, engineering, and mixing thing and running the charities and teaching class and and doing the music playground uh, stuff, which is sync, film, TV, advertising. Sync is like a whole different muscle group, which is really exciting to uh, to jump into. But like any new venture, it's a little nerve wracking as well. Yeah. So tell us about um, teaching. What's this? What's this class you're teaching? Is there anything? Is it sort of general? Is there anything specific about it? Um, yeah. I mean, what we tried to do. What I wanted to do. Uh, when I joined Marco doing this was um, I wanted the class that I would have died for if I were, when I were 20, you know, like, cause I mean, you and I both went through the same program and it was great. And we had great instructors and, you know, we got a lot of studio time, honestly. I don't know if they can anymore. There's, there's a lot more students and, you know, yeah, really. but um, you know, there's a difference between book learning um, and how the real world actually works. Yeah, so I remember we, a lot of book book learning when yeah, I was Yeah, and it was and it, I mean it was great and and there's a there's a ton of invaluable stuff in that but um you know at some point you you leave school and you walk into the real world and a lot of times people are walking into the real world completely unprepared. So what we decided to do was do a class that we call a minor in reality where it's like okay, so you're going into the music business, here's how it actually works. You know, we're going to give you inside uh information you know, an inside look at at how we see it and how other people see it. And we bring in experts and like heavy hitters to help eludicate that. Like when, you know, when we're talking about concert promotion, then we bring in Ashley Capps, who started AC Entertainment, invented Bonnaroo. That's right. Sold the whole thing for $450 million like two years ago. You want to talk to somebody about how to do shows from the smallest club show in, in Knoxville to Bonnaroo? Here's Ashley. Let's talk yeah. to him about it. Yeah. Stuff like that, you know? So... Um, it's a huge advantage to get the students as exposed to as much stuff as possible. We do actual, we don't really do homework or we don't do assignments. We do actual practical stuff from, you know, I mean, dealing with social media to dealing with, I mean, just about any aspect of the music 
the music business. And we try and just give them a crash course in reality. That's pretty fun. I bet you probably learn a ton just by being oh, yeah. there when you're teaching it. I learn, come I think I learn more from them than they learn from me. Uh, that's the story of my podcast right here. I didn't realize it when I started this, but after over 200 interviews, I, I'm working on things and I realize, you know, looking in hindsight, I'm like, Shit, I had no clue about this stuff when I started this podcast. Totally, totally. It's great. Anything that gives you a different perspective is great. And and then the other thing that's really crucial, which I really wish somebody had talked to me about, was we talk a lot about philosophy. You know, we talk about imposter syndrome. Yeah. And we talk about failure and how it happens and how you deal with it and how you move through it. You know, um, and we talk very openly about that. I remember coming in one day and I was like, okay, so here's what happened to me this week. Um I, I had somebody write to me and say this is the best mix they've ever heard, and they were absolutely overjoyed. And I had somebody write to me, uh, write me an email and say, "Hey, we're going to use somebody else on this. We don't like your work." So I'm trying to figure out why the first one made me happy for ten minutes, and the second one made me bummed out for like it's going to make me bummed out for like three weeks. Right, longer because, than the happiness. Right. right, and that should be a wash. You should just be like, "Well, oh, this this week was okay. You know, win a few, lose a few." But humans don't work that way, and everybody expects that humans do work that way. So it's really great to have these kids, you know, having people come in and saying, "Yeah, I made 150 million dollars last year, and I'm still scared that someone's going to turn to me and say, you don't actually know what you're doing, do you?'" <laughs> nice. Like that fear. Yeah, exactly. So just knowing that that exists is a huge boost. Um, I think you had one of our favorite quotes on the podcast where you said, if you're not getting fired from a record, then you're not yeah, trying, trying hard, hard enough. It's yeah. a good one, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm, it still hurts to get fired, but you know, it's better to keep trying. Yeah, well, that's a great reminder. All right, so very cool that you're doing the teaching thing. Um, what are a couple of the other takeaways that you feel like you've already learned from the teaching? You know, What were some different areas of the music industry that somebody came in and you were like, wow, I had no idea? I mean, the one realization is that the music industry has changed so insanely fast. I mean, if you think about it from altitude, the paradigm that um, was happening in the 60s and 70s was insanely complicated, ex insanely expensive, you know? Like you got to go yeah. into a million dollar studio with experts and you got to record on all this expensive equipment and then you got to take it to a mastering studio and they're going to like you know, put some nail polish on a on a plate and like drag hot rocks across it. And then that's going to go to another <laughs> place and they're going to seal it and sign it and stamp it and push it and all this stuff. And now um, you can get on an iPad and you can have a song that you created today distributed to the entire planet tonight. Yeah. And you don't even have to create it by yourself. You can create it with other people in other cities by sending all a text message yeah. to them. Yeah, it's 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 I mean it's an incredible paradigm shift for music and it's yielded two things. A lot of really great music and a lot of really not great music. Yeah, that's true. You know. That's probably what we had back in the day. It's just it felt my, like much more of a thrift store or a back of the record store find when you found some funky record that somebody had done that was just terrible but yeah. kind of awesome at the same time. Well, there were gate there were gatekeepers, right? And those gatekeepers don't exist anymore. So the noise to signal is way off the charts now and and part of the challenge and part of what we talk to these kids is how do you get noticed? How do yep. you build a brand? How do you build your tribe? How do you, you know, how do you become a, a working musician? And the other thing is this realization that if you're getting into music to make money, quit now. Right. Like, it's ridiculous. There, there was, you know, there's a time you can still make money. Um, you know, there's there's big money to be made in just about any avenue of work in this on this planet. But, the, you know, the... Music is for creatives, like people who are dying to be creative. And if you can eke out a living, if you can make a decent living doing music, then you're winning. Yeah. You know, so you kind of have to take the delusion of grandeur away. It's true. I mean, if you just can really enjoy, I mean, I, I try and think about it like this. When you begin, you look at the music and you say, that looks like a lot of fun. Like, I like music a lot. I mean, you just kind of want to do the opposite of what your parents are doing or whatever. Sure. And then when you get there, if you can actually do that, that's what you wanted. Amazing. Yeah. But, you know, you, you got to tell these kids, it's like, look, if you're not bleeding out of multiple orifices in that you're going to do music or you're going to die, you might want to consider another career. Like one of the hallmarks I use um, is one of the first things I tell any class is like, you know, let me see hands, like who plays video games and whoever raises their hand, I'm like, you're not going to win you're the out. music business. Yeah. <laughs> 
Because, you know, you don't have time to play video games because the guy who's going to kick your ass or the girl who's going to wipe the floor with you isn't playing video games. They're working on getting better right now. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I, I luckily for me, the last video game I played was when I realized that I get dizzy playing them now, so I just physically can't <laughs> play them anymore. Because, you know, sometimes you just do wish you could kind of have some fun outside of the studio, too. Well, you totally can, but, you know, I mean, it's... it's uh, you got to manage your time. Well, dude, our our studio life has turned into a video game. It's Kinda all video has. games now. Yeah, that's it's right. Like plugins and knobs and weird graphics and things flying all over the screen. <laughs> yeah, and we it's haven't even gotten better immersive from audio yet. Yeah. <laughs> that's coming, man. Actually, I got some interviews uh, where I'm going to be doing 360 mixing and surround stuff, and I'm pretty excited about it. Oh, well, the guy you need to talk to on that is Paul David Hager. Paul David Hager. Oh, yeah. You got to get PDH in here. He's a genius. He's just a genius on multiple levels, but he's uh, he's jumped into the Atmos thing, and we were talking about it the other day, and and uh, he's, uh, yeah, he's amazing. He's a, he's a guy you got to talk to. He's done incredible studio stuff, incredible live stuff, um, like everything from Jonas Brothers to Beck. Like, guy's amazing. Cool, so, cool. All right. Well, Paul, we'll get you I'm getting the, you on here, man. We'll get you on the show, Paul. Looking forward to it. Um how about the music playground? You want to tell us a little bit about that project you got going? Yeah, um, uh, I'm friends with a couple of guys that run it. It's a uh, it's a going concern. They've been around for you know over ten years. They've had thousands and th- I mean over eight thousand sinks and millions of dollars in placements. And they work in TV, film, and advertising. And they just kind of asked me to come on and and throw some creative vision into, you know, where the sync industry is going and how we can utilize the insane talent in Nashville, the players and the writers and the artists and stuff to, you know, make some really cool sync stuff. So that was a really exciting invite. And So you get to, so are you picking up an instrument for this sort of thing or is it more like be uh, a production capacity and a recording uh, capacity? And as of right now, together? it's kind of, it's kind of creative direction and, and casting. Uh, you know, we're, we're working on building a, studio that we can do stuff in um so no not i'm not doing any composer stuff at this point um you know and let's face it like i'm i'm behind the i'm behind the glass because i can't play <laughs> you know i don't i don't admit to playing anything in nashville so uh, as a reminder of course we want to go listen to episode 19 to hear more of your backstory but give us a quick reminder refresher on you know your what instruments you have played or don't play. Oh God! Whatever. So yeah, I don't. I don't admit to playing any instruments in this town because right. you know, come on. But I uh, I've heard that line before. Yeah, I mean, I started on I started on drums and keyboards and and sang in bands and choir and stuff like that. So I, I'm 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 barely talented enough to drop like some keyboards or some beats or some percussion and stuff on songs. And I have snuck in the occasional background vocal, but. Sometimes I think that helps when you're in the engineering mixing production capacity because you're you you have a sense of what sounds good and feels good and you've got just enough knowledge to air drum along with it. Yeah. And that's about all you need, you yeah, know. Just slightly Turn dangerous. it over to those who are more capable. <laughs> totally. <laughs> um cool. And then um so and with Music Playground, you guys are gonna be putting together music for sync licensing. Any insights you want to share just on what sync licensing is all about or or uh you know what do you have do you have something that comes to mind as a first question or something that people need to get straight about that that topic? Well, you know, a lot of people are like, "Ooh, can I I want to get my music in, you know, film and TV and commercials." And yes. That always sounds like an exotic like, "Yeah, that sounds great." Yeah, it's fantastic. And you know, a lot of people have made um made a lot of money doing that. And a lot of people have, you know, raise their profile by doing that. I mean, if you land a Mercedes ad during the Super Bowl, like people are going to listen to that song and be like, dude, who is that? You know, it's super cool. Um, but the crazy thing is like the the stuff that we look for when we're making records and we're doing, you know, radio hits and stuff like that is completely different than the sync stuff. Like the sync stuff is based around um, emotions and um, lyrics that can connect on a very wide emotional base and things that are like uplifting or driving. And a lot of times you're getting briefs where it's like, okay, I need something that's like uplifting, driving, positive, you know, bouncy, and I need it in like two hours. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> immediately, please. Yeah, it's immediately or if not sooner. And I, I'm really amazed with the guys at the the music playground, the amount of stuff that they're able to turn around in such a short period of time that's such high quality. Like it blows my mind, man. It's hard. When they ask you, or when you ask them, how soon would you like that? The answer is always, it's already overdue. Yeah, pretty much. Like I see briefs come through all the time at 
four or five o'clock in the in the evening and it's due at eleven AM the next day. Nice. Yeah. So a lot of times that's not, not something you're you're creating for. That's something that you're pulling from a library, you know, of yeah. original music or from bands and artists or stuff like that. Yeah, there's probably um in what you said a moment ago about the you know, if you're not getting fired, you're doing you're not trying hard enough. That's more about experimentation and bold moves and and maybe in music licensing. You do want some bold moves, but you want to be making the bold, correct move. Yeah, but as much as you can. Morning. Yeah, you know. Cool. All right. Good insight. Um, tell us about Song Farm. What's that all about? Oh man, Song Farm. So, you know, if you're fortunate enough to get to a certain level in music or in anything really, but for me, it's music. I think that it's um, your responsibility to send the elevator back down, right? So uh, funding for creative arts in in schools in this country is horrendous. Um, And I can give you a hundred stories from friends of ours who say, man, the only thing that saved me in high school was music, you know? Um, Or I was supposed to be, I talked to one person that was like, you know, they they were going to give me drugs for ADHD until one of my teachers said, well, you just need to give them a guitar, right? And that like set this person on the path of amazing amount of productivity. So... Um, my friend Ross Copperman, uh, had a, you know, he, he wanted to get back to his high school. He had a great inspiring, um, teacher who was both his football coach and his like music drama coach. And he wanted to give back. So we started talking about putting a studio in his high school in Virginia. And that morphed into the idea that if we could do that once, why don't we do it a hundred times? And why don't we talk to the songwriters and creators that we all know in Nashville and say, Hey, you know, you've, You've had all the success. Why don't we give back to these kids? And then that started to turn itself into a concept called Song Farm. And then uh, we've recently picked up a partnership with Save the Music, who puts a lot of band instruments and production stuff and hip hop stuff into a ton of schools. And uh, we've created a partnership called Hometown to Hometown, where we're going to go out and do Ross's school in Virginia. And then we're going to do a, um, a Title I high school here in Nashville that has need. And then we're going to go do Nicole Galen's in Kansas and another school in Nashville. So we're kind of, you know, we're we're Music City USA, right? We got a base here. If we're not providing uh, access to like creative outlet in our schools in Nashville, like we're huge losers. So we we need to like fan those flames. Unfortunately, sometimes Nashville seems to forget that it's Music City when it comes to home studios. But that's a whole nother topic. We'll remind it. (laughs) (laughs) Mine in particular. Um, Awesome. Well, very cool, man. Well, so... You know, one of the things that you are certainly known for is your excellent work in mixing. Thank um, you. You were known for that back when we were classmates in school. I remember you bringing in, you know, class projects and being like, wait a minute, that doesn't sound like the rest of the class projects. <laughs> well, that's kind of you. Um, what's what's on your mind as far as mixing goes these days? Is there anything new to your um, your your layout and your setup, you know, your methodology of mixing? Are you using any new tools, for example? Well, I mean, I feel like there's a new tool that comes out every week, you know? I mean, things are just constantly moving forward. And sometimes it's exciting that there's always something new to try. And sometimes it's it's exhausting. It's like, you know, do we really need another digital EQ? Do we really need, you know, whatever? So, Speaking of which, I think I installed a plugin, a new plugin into my Pro Tools and broke it just before the series. Yeah, so well, there's like that too, jump through right? a whole bunch yeah. of hoops to get two tracks to record, but that's, they're going. That's a little, there's a little bit of, that's a little scary too, you know? Because it's just guaranteed that if you put something new in your rig, you know, it's going to break. And it's usually going to break when the artist comes over, you know? And the more famous the artist is, the more it's going to break while he's over there or she's over there. So Yeah, in my experience, you're right. It's either going to break just before the artist arrives or it's going to break right at the beginning of your personal time off. Right, totally. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's like it knows. I, I think there's a personality to Pro Tools. <laughs> Text message from family telling you how delicious dinner is going to uh, be. Computer breaks. Yeah, totally. Absolutely. 
I did a mic shootout for my vocals in the studio and tried 20 different microphones from the Shure SM7 to a vintage Neumann U67, but was impressed that my favorite of all was the Roswell Pro Audio Delphos 2 large diaphragm condenser. Handcrafted in California, Roswell Mics brings you inspired design and attention to detail to help you capture a gorgeous vintage sound without the vintage price tag. Check out their beautiful microphones, including the Mini K47 for only $349 at Roswell proaudio.com Well, you know, I mean there's a the nice thing about it is there's a hundred different ways to skin the cat now. So the way I work is a little bit throwback. Um I've been doing this for for a number of years, but only because I don't get much time to experiment, like change stuff up. Um and which is obviously critical to what you do because that's what you, it's the experimenting that gets you fired, hopefully. Yeah, well, I mean, you can experiment with techniques, but experimenting with a whole new layout, I mean, it gets it gets a little tough. I and mean, we're working on a record right now. Um, I've been working on records that people call me, and it was like three years ago, and they want to change stuff, right? Dude, I have trouble opening sessions from three months ago. I know it's it's a little bit scary, but it, it's it's become there's become a perception that nothing is ever finished and that you can always open it, but then. You know, different versions of software, different versions of platforms, different versions of computers. It just doesn't work that way. So, yeah, true. you know, but what are you going to do, right? You just soldier on. Just, just make rock and roll. Right. As much as you can. As much as you can. All right. So, um, so what about, you know, I think I remember last time you were using, you know, you're using tools like Pro Tools, but you're also, you've got an SSL console in mm-hmm. front of you. Um, and you, you had sort of your own personal hybrids for using different things. Um, is that still part of, you, of your workflow? Have it is, you yeah. transitioned in any particular direction? Yeah, no. I mean, there's there's stuff that works really great through an SSL and stuff that doesn't, and stuff that works great through Outboard and stuff that works great through plugins. So I like my room set up the way I've got it because it's just eminently flexible. I can do whatever at any time. You know, some some pro- I do projects. I do a couple projects a year for like Disney where it's four or five hundred tracks a song. And it has to be turned in on like 36 stereo stems. So obviously I'm not mixing that through the console. Um, right, right. I can just bounce stuff or I can, you know, yeah, I can just render it out through outboard gear if I need it or what have you. So um, when you're looking at a mixed project, um, I don't know how to, how you want to answer this question, but maybe, maybe just answer it in terms of advice to the rock stars. So like, you know, there's always this concept of like, um, of setting rates for mixes for for people who are trying to figure that out for the first time, and it's like, well, how do I do that? You know, what's the right what's the right rate to do for this? And then you look at it and you think, well, this project might be totally different from this one. How do, how do you balance? You know, you answer this any way you want, but how do you balance the difference between different mix projects between a four hundred track in the box thing versus one where you really want to like run it through a bunch of gear and do a bunch of things? And what tips would you have for people? Well, as far as rates go, um, I would say the one tip is to stop using forty four point one k. I know that's a joke, nice, but no, go. but it, it actually. Hey, that's what Pro Tools wouldn't record in forty four one. Oh, really? So we're in ninety six now for I this. Think, I think everyone should just stop using forty four one um, for a multitude of reasons. But uh, um, no, I I love the joke about that. I mean, it's the audio business. We still haven't decided pin two, pin three, hot right. So no one's going to ever. I just got burned on that recently. <laughs> And no one's gonna, no one's gonna learn it. Sample rates are gonna be all over the place. Um, setting rates on mixes, man. I, I, I generally charge by the mix, um, and it goes all over the place. You know, honestly. Like, so that's one of those things where um, the advice might be just like figure out what works for you, and then you just, you just mix this way today for this project because it's what you want to do to make a great sound. And yeah, whatever. I mean, whatever works. Um, yeah. Setting rates is so difficult. There was this great story from back in the day where some woman was sitting in a restaurant and there was an old man sitting next to her drawing on a napkin. And, um, you know, she kind of like looked over and saw the picture that he was drawing. And she was just like, wow, that looks amazing. Can I buy that from you? And he looked up at her and he said, sure, it's $60,000. And she was like, what are you talking about? It only took you five minutes to draw that. And he said, no, ma'am, it took me 60 years to draw this. And it was Pablo Picasso. Nice. <laughs> is that so, really true? It is true. Well, Pablo, I don't know. Pablo, I say it's true. I love that there was a woman said, well, I mean, it was before the internet, so not right. everybody knew Everything's what it looked true. like in a photo. <laughs> what is truth, really? I just love that there was a woman sitting next to Pablo drawing on a napkin. 
Well, I, I can much. actually vouch for that because for the longest time at Barney Greengrass in the Upper West Side in New York, there was a napkin drawing in the window that he had drawn because he used to hang out there and sometimes he wouldn't have money, so he'd just draw him sketches. I wonder how much um, Basquiat would have sold that that uh, maple syrup drawing that he did with the, right. with the menu in the movie. Yeah, who knows, right? <laughs> and who knows who you're sitting next to in a... In a $60,000. I know, right? <laughs> this is going to drip off the table before I can even put it on my pancakes. <laughs> All right, so... Um, Let's see what what else do I want to talk about. If you, let's let's talk about mixing in the box for a minute because obviously a lot of people who are listening to this. That's the tool they've got. They don't yeah. have much else to work. It's great. With. So talk to us a little bit about you know some of the process for doing that. And I guess this one is really a general question, but um, you know when you start out, how do you like to approach it? What are some of the first moves that you would make? Just a mix in general. Do? Yeah, a mix in general. But let's just let's just put it in the context of we're doing this in Pro Tools. Well, you know, I mean, to me, mixing is just mixing. Um, the The secret to mixing is turning knobs until it sounds good, right? So I suppose if the knob is virtual and you're turning it with your Kensington expert mouse, the, the theory still applies. Or your virtual reality goggles. Right, which so, I, I'm looking forward to the whole AR thing. I, I, I am big time. I think it'll be great. But, um, I mean, it's the same as anything else. You, you have to... I mean, so the, the the real key to mixing is that the technical side of it takes a massive backseat to the actual job of mixing, which is creating emotional impact. You know, mixing is about emotion. It's about connecting the song and the artist with the listener, you know, and if if um, if part of the way you need to do that is by doing things wrong, then by all means, do things wrong. Um, you know, I won't tell the Grammy committee if you don't. Nobody's nobody's grading you on a on a um, you know check boxes. It's not you know you're not going down saying he did this, he did this, he did this. Um, so mixing in the boxes is, is the same as mixing anything else. Like listen to the song, figure out what it's trying to say, figure out the um, you know how to best position the vocalist and what the important things are that really make the song stand out. The hooks and and then I usually you know build from the rhythm section on up, always checking against the vocal because the the biggest dumb move you can make while mixing is mix a whole song without the vocal on. As soon as you turn the vocal on, everything changes. The EQs yeah. change, the balances change, like everything changes. Yeah. It's a mistake I've made the vocal a thousand doesn't times. Fit anyway, yeah, yeah, it doesn't fit anywhere because you didn't leave room for it because it wasn't there. You know, you kind of have to make that mistake in the beginning to get used to it. Yeah, you totally do. Like I, you have to make it about a thousand times, which is how many times I made. I still make it. You know, I still I'm make still that mistake. Yeah, <laughs> I get into a song and it's totally cool, and I'm listening to all this stuff, and then I push up the vocal. And I was like, oh, you know, yeah, I have I to, it. I have to comment that I think a little bit of that might be also the fact that inevitably we're going to be mixing a lot of songs where everything sounded great until we had to listen to the singer. Yeah, because well, you don't always true. get to work with totally brilliant, amazing singers. Sometimes it's not the best instrument. No, no, it's not. But then, then again, you know, a lot of people. I mean. Bob Dylan, I don't like his voice, but he's an, he's a great singer. Nice. Like his, Make sure we can understand his lyrics. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he doesn't care. All right, so here's some questions in the context of um, the emotion of a mix. How do you make something sound angry? Oh, that's a good question. Well, I mean, the first thing I would say is if it's supposed to sound angry and it doesn't sound angry when it gets yeah. to you, then maybe it isn't supposed to sound angry. All right. Um, I, I mean, I think the easiest thing that, that everybody reaches for in that point is distortion. But um, I mean, if you want to make something sound angry, just EQ it hard. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people shy away from digital EQ using extreme digital EQ for two reasons. One is it doesn't, it's not as forgiving as analog. I looked at my SSL the other day and like the stuff that I had on drums, it was, you know, high frequency plus 15, mid frequency plus 15, like four or five channels of that, yeah. like just maxed out, um, you know, Sometimes it keeps sounding better. Yeah, it's sometimes it's just like you know, make it hurt, and and let it poke out. Like, yeah. But it is true; it doesn't always respond the same way in digital. But um, I think that with digital, sometimes we look at the screen and we're we feel like, well, we shouldn't be turning that knob up so much. It's not supposed to go up that high. It's a weird thing. It is. Well, it's just human. Why right? would they give us a knob that goes all the way up if you're not supposed to go all the way up? With well, it? why are you looking at something and saying that doesn't sound right? Because you, because your your Kensington trackball <laughs> doesn't give yeah. you a, a feeling that the knob's all the way up. Guess R that's it. Richard Dodd told me a story um, some 
some time ago where he said he was working on this record for this band. I think they were a European band and they had nailed the whole record except for one song. And for whatever reason, the mix on that song just wasn't working. So he was like, okay, I'm going to just break it out of my console and go full analog. You know, so he does that and they loved it. And then he's like, all right, well, these guys are in Europe and I'm sure they're going to have changes. So I'm going to just document it. I'm going to take pictures of the console. And he realized as he was taking pictures of the console and the outboard gear, that the moves he was making on that was way more extreme than he would ever allow himself to do in the box. Um, probably just because he wasn't looking at how much he was turning a knob at what you know what value it was. He was just turning it until it sounded good. And yeah. He said that was kind of an aha moment. You know, there might be another aspect to that too. In the box, you begin to understand that, like, okay, you can put plugins on it, and then you you learn the power of like disable the plugin or bypass it. You know, listen to it, A, B it, A, B it. And you can do some of that in the analog world, but not quite as much. Yeah. You know, like you can't, in the analog world, you engage something and it's not the same volume as it was a moment ago. Sure. It's just like the combination of all these things. So maybe that, you know, bypassing things and getting like real tweaky with it is not, it's not helping <laughs> maybe. us. Maybe, you know, I noticed that world. a lot of people ask a lot of the times, like, well, how does that compare to this? Or how does that compare to that. And my answer is always like, who gives a shit? Yeah. Like, first of all, who has time to sit around comparing? Well, like, the only thing it sh- I feel like it should ever really compare to is that thing in your head that you were yeah. inspired to try and create. Yeah. And then and then you but and then so you look and I'm guilty of this. I if you look at the plugins, like if I hit the plugin, like I have I probably have 200 EQ plugins on my system. Yeah. The guys that make the records that we loved had a high EQ and a low EQ, and it was like zero plus three or minus three, right? Yeah. And that was it, you know? And they were making records that were fantastic. Um, uh, and and it's like, man, there is there is such a thing as um, as decision paralysis. And when you get all that stuff in there, and, you, you, and then you think like, well, Andy Wallace made all these amazing records on an SSL with like an LA-2A and A1176, and that's it. So maybe you don't need all these options. Maybe you just need an EQ and compressor and you need to spend your time working on shaping the mix instead of picking which plugin you might want to use. Yeah. Well, um, and that's fun when you begin to discover that. So let's talk a little bit about um, what what might people consider as far as what to put on their mix, mixing in the box so that they maybe start, you know, there's this, I remember when I first, Heard about it, I was like, I heard the expression top-down mixing. I'm like, what is that? We're like people mixing shirtless? I was like, yeah, I was already doing that. Yeah. It wasn't helping. Or like, you know, I picture like it's got some reference to a, a convertible or something. But okay, you're going to have to clue me in on top-down mixing. So I think, I think finally I understood that top-down mixing is this idea simply of saying, you know, start with making the stereo bus sound good and then sort of balance instruments into that and then address, you know, the individual instruments after that as opposed to, Starting like we all kind of do, where we start with the kick drum and we listen to the kick drum for half an hour, right? And move to the snare drum. Um, so, wh- where am I going with that? So, the question is: um, any thoughts about some things that might be kind of cool to put on the stereo mix as a first thing to explore? Yeah, I mean, how I, I can tell you what's on my stereo mix bus, and this is great. This is digital and analog, and I mean, it varies; it, it hops around, but. Um, on any given day, uh, there'll always be a MOG EQ um, because their EQs are amazing, analog and digital, and you know they don't do phase shifts. So a little bit of low and a little bit of high on the MOG EQ is great. There'll always be um, probably a dangerous Bax EQ also. Um, and there's going to be some kind of compression. It's going to be SSL compression. Um, it's going to be Fairchild um, a lot of the times, because um, I made the mistake of actually getting a Fairchild in six seventy. Yeah, and now it's it's on everything, which is probably a bad idea because at some point it's gonna catch on fire or whatever, and then I I won't be able to like <laughs> recall anything <laughs> for like what a week. A, what's the needle do <laughs> on a six seventy? Not much, mix? not much. It's like the most expensive dB of compression ever. Yeah, but. You know, I mean, it's just character, right? So uh, I I plug in transformers into my mix bus sometimes, just the transformer, just to yeah. get different colors. Yeah. Um, and if you're doing that in the box, there's an insanely great plugin uh, by a company called Kazrog called True Iron. 
And um, they literally painstakingly, um, like completely obsessively, crazily uh, modeled all of these old Transformers. And man, it's magic on things. And who's that by again? Kazrog. Kazrog. Yeah. That sounds like a character from Homestar Runner. Yeah, totally. Totally. Trogdor. Um, Yeah. And it's, it's magic. I use it on, like, sometimes it's, it's like gear, right? Sometimes it sounds incredible on a vocal and then on somebody else's vocal, it, it doesn't work at all. You know, drums, you know, mix bus, stuff like that. It's definitely worth checking out. It's, it's pretty amazing. What's the best vocal mic? (laughs) The best (laughs) vocal mic is the one that's in front of a really good singer. When they're singing really good. Sure. Um, you know, and that's, yeah, everybody asks that too. Um, well, there's actually a, um, there's a company, yeah, there's a company called Audio Test Kitchen that's going to let you listen to, you know, different mics in in, uh, in insanely detailed similar circumstances, which I think is going to be really, a really cool way to to make some decisions. Yeah, Alex is awesome. They're doing a very cool thing, laser beams. Laser man. beams, All man. about laser beams. So many lasers. Um, okay, cool. So true iron. I like that. So it's putting the colors on there onto the mix bus. And then do you find that it's helpful to sort of have your mix bus pre-populated with things you're most likely to use and then just sort of enable, disable to see if yeah, you like something? Yeah, I mean, that's the way when I'm working analog, my mix bus is pre-populated, right? And th- I just have it on a dangerous liaison so I can just pop things in and out, you know, see what works. Dangerous liaison. I think I had too many of those yeah. when I was younger. <laughs> <laughs> Never too many. <laughs> Did you, um, so, so, uh, w- at what stage are you deciding which one of these things you might want to use on your stereo bus? Is it like right at the beginning and, and how much of the music is coming through when you're making those decisions? Is it like a balance of everything? Is it the rough mix? Any, any thoughts about it's that? It's everything. And, um, honestly, the, because I'm fortunate enough to get to do a lot of mixing, you know, uh, after a while, you start to kind of see an average. So it's like, oh, okay, so we're doing this type of song. And that's probably going to end up being the, you know, the SSL and the Fairchild and the Mog and maybe some Transformer stuff and, you know, maybe a little bit of high frequency limiting or maybe a little bit of Baxon Hall filter. It's just, you just leave that on there and work through it. Um, that the, you can get yourself into trouble in two different ways. And I see this a lot. One, I can always tell the tracks when people have been building a production, like building a track, producing through like a massive multi-band limiter on their mix bus because then when they print the tracks, they're all at minus 70 and nothing makes sense. You're listening to the kick drum and you're like, man, this does not sound like the kick drum on the rough. It's because the rough has like 20 dB of EQ. Totally different kick drum on the rough. Totally different. By the time it goes through the mix. And the way everything interrelates when they're producing, as soon as they turn that mix bus limiter off, everything falls apart, you know, and they don't, a lot of times they don't think about that. So the the key, um, the key is when you're building tracks, don't put anything on the mix bus, mm-hmm. right? Um, but when you're mixing them, keep the stuff on the mix bus from Jump Street, and and also don't give in to the crazy conspiracy theory that, man, you know, when you get a mix all done, then you like turn off the limiter and send it to the mastering guy so there's room on the master. That is the dumbest period <laughs> advice period ever. Period. <laughs> Um, it's never been given on this podcast, never, not even by me ever, but I'm with you on that. I mean, I, I, it's this kooky idea that we're supposed to trust our ears to make music, but then right at the last moment, it's like, but just in case, don't trust your ears. Well, you know? and you know, it's funny, get back, getting back to the top of the conversation, that is imposter syndrome. That is the overwhelming doubt, like, am I doing this right? Am I screwing this up? Maybe maybe I'm doing this totally wrong. I could have screwed this whole thing up. You know, that's just, that's just part of the process. Yeah. We all do it. Yeah. Um, where are the places that you run into where you're like, ah, I'm screwing this up again. I need to back up from this thing or, or solve it. I have learned to listen to the little voice in my head that says, this isn't done. Because sometimes you're like, man, I really want to, I really want to go home. Or they really said they needed it by tonight. But the the real, the real fact is there's no such thing as a musical emergency. They never need it by tonight. And if you send out something that's not great, it's going to bite you a hell of a lot more than if you just say, hey man, I just, I needed to come in in the morning and take a quick listen. So just get up early Drink extra coffee, go into the studio at 6.30 in the morning, take a fresh listen, and 99 times out of 100, you'll be like, oh, 
I'm glad I didn't send that. That was a bonehead move and you'll fix it in, yeah. in 10 minutes. It's kind of remarkable what you're capable of in mixing and music production at 6.30 in the morning. It is. Yeah, bizarrely. Bizarrely. And then by 7.30, you're toast again already. Well, yeah. Maybe, I mean, maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> I, I found out after working years and years and years, working till four in the morning, that I can get more done between eight and noon than I can get done between noon and eight. Yep. yep. You know, so it's budgeting not always your time. I can get a lot done between noon and eight if it's just musical composition, I found. Hmm. I can, I can get, if I want to get lost in my own creativity, I can come up with some weird stuff in the middle of the night playing yeah. music with friends. But if it's, if it's making a judgment call on, on, you know, a kick, you know, just with real perspective, then yeah, my, my ears are in much better shape in the morning. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, you can't, you can't listen and concentrate hard for 12 hours and be as good at the end of it than you are at the beginning. Yeah. I actually I should clarify that. So so if it's playing and making sure I'm reading a chart properly and you know having a clear head, then the daytime stuff is great for music. If it's if it's being in kind of a spacey zone where I mishear something and all of a sudden I hear a melody and and I capture it, sometimes the late night stuff is great for that. Right. You know? And the secret to all of that, um, for you, for me, for anyone else, is knowing yourself well enough to know when that stuff happens and how it happens and paying attention to it so that you can maximize, you know, the good that yeah. can come out of that. Yeah. Um, how do you avoid or how should somebody avoid imposter syndrome? I don't think you can avoid it. I think it just exists, but you just tell yourself that it exists and that you have it and everyone else has it and, you know, you just need to move through it. So... <laughs> This is out of order, but what is imposter syndrome? <laughs> <laughs> we can edit that around, right? Uh, imposter syndrome is the overwhelming fear that at some point someone's going to turn to you and point at you and say, Liz, you, you actually don't even know, you don't know what you're doing, do you? And then you're like, oh my God, they finally found me out. No, I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm faking all of this. It's pretty much the, the feeling that every creative has all of the time. And okay, it's, it. it's six steps. This is awesome. This is tricky. This is shit. I am shit. This might be okay. This is awesome. <laughs> nice. That's exactly. That it. loop is what we're all in all of the time. Yeah. And you have to just put your head down and rock through it and not listen to not listen to the demons. Yeah. And that's why the process, enjoying the process is so critical because that's all you got. Yeah. Like there's no start and end. It's just the process. Absolutely. I mean, find just for life in general, for those of you playing at home, uh, find what puts you into a flow state and make that your job and your life will be awesome. You know, that's the, that's the key. If playing drums puts you in a flow state, find a way to play drums for a living. What puts you in a flow state? Mixing. I, I mean, I can, I can literally, you know, get into a song and look up and it's six hours later and I didn't eat lunch and, you know, like I didn't even notice. It gets you into horrible, horrible relationship trouble sometimes, you know, because uh, you just don't notice the passage of time. Yeah. And it was way worse in a, I'm looking around your studio. Like when I had a studio that didn't have windows, it was way worse because you just didn't notice. Now I have windows. So at least there's a, it's like, oh, it's getting dark. Okay. That, and that means it's getting late. I've got a window that in the distance lets in the light from a window. So that's that's okay. about as good yeah, as, as long get. as long as yeah, whatever. But I remember I remember that feeling that's half elation and half dread when you like I would walk outside after a session and like the birds would be singing at night and I'd be like, Oh, it's gotta be like five in the morning. <laughs> yeah. Or you like you go into the studio and then you step outside and it's pitch black and it's snowed. Yeah. And you're, you're like, like, What the life is happening somewhere else? <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, let's take a break for a moment. We'll come back in for the jam session. Rockstar's reminder before we go, um, before we take a break, on your mobile device or wherever you listen to the podcast, just scroll down in the show notes and you'll find links to stuff we're talking about, including a YouTube playlist, which has got some of the tracks that um, Reed has sent over to us. And we'll see you guys in just a minute for the jam session. 
The Spectra 1964 model was created by the missile engineers who are central in rolling out the systems that have protected the free world for over half a century. The extremely stable high circuit design of the 101 amplifier provides unequaled headroom, low noise, and linear output, irrespective of transient audio peaks, giving you clearer, punchier, dynamic recordings. During the height of record making, the 101 preamp was the perfect choice to build consoles for Tom Dowd, Muscle Shoals, Stack Studios, Ardent Studios, and New York City record plant, bringing you the sounds of ZZ Top, Aerosmith, Bruce Springsteen, King Crimson, John Lennon, and so many more. The Spectra 1964 legacy is carried on today through Bill Cheney and Jim Romney. Now you can get that same sound in your studio with the STX100 Mic Pre and STX500 EQ. Add the Cinemag Transformer BBDI and the C610 Comp Limiter, and you can have a truly awesome sound. Go to Spectra1964.com to learn more or click the link in the show notes below. Are you using a Mac in your recording studio? Are you tired of feeling like the studio setup you worked so hard to create is becoming obsolete too quickly? Wouldn't it feel great to have a trusted friend to help you keep your existing Mac and studio setup current and relevant so that you can focus on the thing you love most, which is making great music? Well, now you can rely on OWC, Otherworld Computing, which you can find at OWC.com, whose mission it is to help you get the most mileage out of your Mac. Whether you need to upgrade your RAM, install an SSD, add more connectivity, or simply find a great used Mac that's ready to rock, OWC will help take your studio far into the future with a vast library of DIY install videos, 24-7 friendly support, and free shipping in the U.S. on most items over $49. Why get frustrated and ditch your existing computer when you can take your studio far into the future with OWC? Learn more at OWC.com and find out how awesome your Mac can be at OWC. It was 1971 in a New York City basement when Eventide revolutionized the audio world by introducing the world's first studio effects processor, the Instant Phaser, and the first digital effect, the H910 Harmonizer. Eventide soon followed with the Instant Flanger, Omnipressor, SP2016 Reverb, and H949 and H3000 Harmonizers, which have been favorites of A-list mixers like Michael Brower, Joe Ciccarelli, Mick Kozowski, and Dave and heard on countless hit records over the decades. Today, Eventide brings all that sound to your stage and studio with modern solutions like the H9000 Harmonizer, their complete line of guitar pedals, including the versatile H9 Max, and transformative plugins like Micropitch, Physion, Black Hole, and Mangled Reverb. Take your next mix in your studio to a whole new level. Go to eventide.com or click the link in the show notes below. Are you sick of bothering family and neighbors when you're just trying to rehearse or record your music? Do outside noises or computer fans get into your studio mics and ruin your recordings? You could book a pro studio to record every time, but that would add up quickly, and doing permanent construction to soundproof your studio can easily cost up to $100,000 or more. Trust me, I know. And you can't take that with you when you eventually move the studio. Don't you wish it was an easy solution right now? Whisper Room ISO Booths offers a simple way to install a comfortable, quiet, ventilated ISO booth in your studio with easy line of sight for recording vocals, guitar amps, or even drums in a variety of sizes. For 30 years, Whisper Room has been solving studio isolation needs worldwide with ISO booths that are shippable, portable, and can be assembled in an afternoon. Now you can get pro vocal recordings right in your home studio, practice whenever you want, and start using real guitar amps again. Get 10% off the 4x4 or 4x6 booths when you mention Recording Studio Rockstars at whisperroom.com or click the link in the show notes below. Hey, Rockstars, we're back now for the jam session. My guest today is F. Reed Ship and joining us to dig into mixing killer records in your studio. Are you ready to jam? Let's jam. Reed. No longer F. No, no longer F. Um, you know, mixing is a tricky thing because obviously there's a lot of teaching that involves encouraging people to just try things. Yes. And develop your palette of sounds from which to select according to your own taste, I imagine. Mm-hmm. But nonetheless, we love learning some new things to try. So 
Well, let's just dig in like that. You know, okay. Let, let's let's start with the the drums. What are some ways to make your drums sound exciting? Let's assuming let's assume you're recording kind of a standard four piece kit. You got the usual stereo overheads and close mics and room mics. Now you want to talk about mixing, right? Not recording. Yeah, mixing. Yeah, but I mean, you know, if if the first step is recording and you need to be aware of it, or maybe you're trying to recreate in the mix process what 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 you might maybe should have done in the recording process. Well, when I record, I paint myself into a lot of corners, so there's probably a lot of things that I should have done that I didn't. But you know, most of the stuff that I get, I don't, I don't track. So, um, yeah, making drums exciting. I mean, I think the biggest thing for me is the was the realization that, except in a few instances, the drum kit is an instrument, a whole instrument. It's not a kick and a snare and a hat and toms and cymbals and all all that stuff. It's it's one entire instrument. I don't know if that just comes from playing drums as a kid. And, you know, when you sit behind a drum kit, it's a thing. So, but I, I mean, I think the thing that really makes it connect with me and with music is to treat the drums as one instrument instead of a bunch of separate ones. Yeah. So that to me makes it really exciting. And then, you know, a lot of times you're just dealing with, um, you know, you're just dealing with what's handed to you. Sometimes you get overheads with a ton of room in them, you know, sometimes you don't. Um, there's a lot of ways you can solve problems now, which is kind of great. I use parallel compression on drums all the time, like exclusively. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about that. Actually, I'll make a comment too when you talk about the drums as one instrument. I feel like I'm learning to record better drums by backing off, backing off, like literally trying to get the mic a little further away from the drum or hmm. the drum set and find capture the sound of the drums there. Yeah. I'm, I'm tending to like those even more. Although with that said, I do love discovering the sort of like what I call the one mic soul trick, you know, the Dapkins kind of thing where you just stick one mic right in between the kick and the snare. Yep. 40 RCA 44 and put it through a compressor and call it a day. It's so awesome. And then you listen back later and you're like, why does that sound so great? It doesn't have as much bottom as the other thing I did. Right. Um, talk about parallel compression. If you were going to introduce um, kind of a general way to to try it out, what would that look like? Um, set up your drums going out a set of outputs and then take a break out of those outputs and put it through a, um, a distressor, a set of distressors. Or in the box, it's called an arouser for whatever The arouser is great. Yeah, it's Thank so cool. Thank you, Dave. Yes, Dave is, Dave is a genius. I, I love Dave. Um, you know, I, I use distressors on drum parallels every day. Um, you know, and and uh, and I couldn't tell you what the settings are, but if you uh, if you want them, you can go to Empirical Labs website. I think he put them on his website. The ones that I use, or you can just email me, and I'll take a picture of them and send them to you. Nice. Um, you know, but the, uh, parallel compression really makes a huge difference with drums, and sometimes it's not it's not a huge volume difference. It's just this this energy, this you know, just. I don't know urgency it's sometimes. The stuff in the yeah, kit that brings yeah, it, forward, right? it is. And uh, I I use I use multiple parallel compressors on drums. I use um, the distressors or equivalent on a whole kit, and uh, or sometimes a neat compressor. Overheads and cymbals and rooms. And yeah, stuff like I mean, I, as well. it's, sometimes you sometimes it goes, sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, you know, you yeah. just kind of like listen. Um, you got to be careful when you're sending kick drums to it. If you send too much kick drum, sometimes they react differently. It's just it's trial and error. Um, you know, if if uh, if you're doing it in the box, you know, if all your drums are going out the drum bus, and you've got sends on all the individuals, you can just sit there and real quickly audition how it sounds like. Mm -hmm. You know, with them in, with them out. You know, you might go back and change it later. Depends, because again, you're probably sitting there listening to the drum kit. And you make the drum kit sound great. You turn all the other instruments on. You're like, whoops, a drum kit can't take that much room up, or it needs more this or needs more that. Right. I also use a um. Uh, an even tied omnipressor as a kick snare Very parallel, cool. which puts a really weird like snap like presence in it, and um, uh, and I, and then I stole a trick from Vance Powell, um, where I used like a combination of distortion and delay that's fed from kick and snare to um, I don't know, just kind of put some thickness and some boogie in it. Um, I I may or may not have a prototype. Of that in my studio, in my in my rack at this point. Oh, you mean like a, a piece of gear that just does that whole yeah. trick for you? Ooh, that's yeah. cool, man. Uh, I actually adopted some of that too, and I've been using um, the Doctor Alien Smith Dirt Mic. Yeah, I stick that one in the in the middle of the kit, 
And then for a minute, I was running that through my Echoplex, the tape Echoplex, and then bringing that in. And now the tape Echoplex needs to go back to the shop again. So right. I'm just grabbing a plug in to kind of... Well, there's that. a guy here that could fix them, by the way. Yeah. Ebo. Um, yeah, I, I uh, almost... Actually, all the time when I cut drums, I use, a, uh, I use an Ampex Omni mic running through a guitar pedal. Hey, can you talk about the Omnipressor? Because I, I don't know much about it. I know it's unusual. It's different yeah, than we're used to. It's a weird, quirky... I don't even know how to explain it. It's like a compressor and an expander. Again... You know, like I'm the worst guy to talk about that. Some guy asked me on the internet the other day, like, what's the topology on this compressor? Is it a FED or an opto? And I was like, <laughs> Do I have to spell topology? I don't know what it, you know, I know what topology is, but I don't care. Like, this sounds cool. So yeah. the Omnipressor sounds cool. And I dicked around with the settings until it sounded cool. So the, the drum parallel makes the drums sound like fat and urgent and, you know, alive. And then the Omnipressor one, like, just brings out some of the attack and the kick and the snare nice. and just. This is one place, making music is the one place you can be both fat and urgent and alive. Right, right. Strangely. <laughs> um, all right, cool. So the Omnipressor, is that one that you would check out for that whole stereo parallel? Or would, oh, no, would it be sorry. like a that's, mono that's up the mono. middle kind of thing? That's mono. Kick and yeah. snare only, mono straight up the middle. Yeah. Um, and then what about the toms? Do the toms ever kind of join the kick and snare thing? And does it really have to be mono in plug-in land, or can it be a stereo plug-in and you're just only sending the kick and the snare to it. I'm sure it could be, but I, I mean, I think that there is definitely something when you screw with something that's just straight up the middle. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that I think people love still about analog that digital doesn't give you is that when you're running through two EQs or two sides of a compressor analog, they're doing different things, right? And the human humans can hear very small time differences, very small phase differences, and it makes things sound quote-unquote wider or bigger or whatever. When you run it through a stereo EQ in the box, it's exactly the same on both sides. That randomization doesn't right. exist. I, I've, I have, uh, actually, why don't we just put this on the podcast? Fab filter, yeah. please put a slight randomization button on your EQ when it's stereo and you hit it, it just slightly randomizes both sides of the EQ. I, like I bet you it would. I bet you it would make a huge difference sonically. You know, um, Graham Cochran did a video that I think he was just reteaching something he had learned, uh, maybe from Andrew Sheps or something like that, about taking two guitar parts that are the same guitar tone doubled, so one's on the left, one's on the right, mm -hmm. and it was a trick where you take, you put like, let's say you put the SSL e EQ on each each one, like the waves or something like that. Yeah. And you just, you know, pick a mid frequency and boost a little on the left guitar. And then you take that same mid frequency and cut it cut a little it. on the yep. right guitar, boost a little low on the right, but cut it on the left. Totally. And sure enough, it does this great widening thing. Yep. That's phase shift, basically. You know, is, same is that as, something that you intentionally practice or do do a trick like that? Is that something somewhere that creeps up? I will say this: I use this a lot. The the built in, um, you know, mod delay, the stereo mod delay on Pro Tools. Um, I have mine set up to automatically open with one side dry and the other side wet 10 milliseconds phase inverted. Yep, that's and, a, oh, so like as a widener effect. Yeah, and like anytime, a, like if I if I feel like something like backgrounds or keyboard pads or just something needs to be widened, I'll just throw that on that thing and see if it works or not. Yeah, okay, so if we're going to go there for a sec, I was just teaching this to... Um, one of my students, Andrew, that's you. Um, we were talking about the Haas effect yes. and how you can you can do a stereo or, a, yeah, I guess you'd call it a stereo delay, basically yeah. a delay on the other side. That's exactly what that is. As a method of panning. Absolutely. Which is pretty cool. Yep, that is the Haas effect. It's head-related transfer function. And thank you, Dan Pfeiffer and John <laughs> Hill for teaching us all that, that stuff. <laughs> Um, no, you can go way down that rabbit hole, and it's really, it's really cool. Or you know, I, I mean, if you want to double a guitar, duplicate it, shift it twenty six milliseconds, and pan it opposite. Yeah, check the phase yep. or polarity. So rock stars, yeah, that that that's it. But I'm also gonna spell it out for you just a little bit. So like, take a mono guitar, yep. panned up the center, put put a delay on it um, where they're both on dry, the left and the right are on dry, and then. Um, I guess put the let say say we want to pan something to the right. Put the left side of that delay all the way wet, and and start at zero millisecond delay, and just come up one, two, three, four, five, and you'll you'll hear the sound start to sound like it's panning over to the right. Yeah, 
and kind of strangely to the right, like maybe even a little bit outside. Yeah, of the like speakers. something's messed up in your head, kind of. Yeah, panic. you have to be careful with checking the polarity and just seeing what sounds right. Yeah, but it's really fun when you discover that and you start experimenting. I, I definitely lost a night in the studio just like messing with things and trying totally. to pan them all yeah, that yeah. way. Yeah, yeah, it's a great trick. Super fun. All right, so um, more drum stuff. Um, yep. You've got uh, somebody sends you room mics or something. So I'm gonna I'm gonna. F- frame the question like this. A lot of times we might be, we might have a whole lot of plugins and a whole lot of power on our computer, but not a whole lot of outboard gear. So therefore, if we're lucky, we got good drums and a good enough space and decent mics, and they're just kind of going in with no EQ, no compression, no treatments. So um, what are some things that you might try out as treatments for those sounds that really you know, if you had had the gear in the first place, you would have made it sound more exciting. Well, like you were saying, the one like the one mic in the center of the kit, if you get a mono overhead or a mono center kit, like send it through an 1176, you know, like a pull up the UAD 1176 black one and just blister it, you know, and see what happens. Yeah, because that one mic thing in the center of the kit, it kind of sounds like shit without compression. It does. Yeah, it just doesn't, it doesn't work. It it's just sounds usable. like, oh, here's a mic. Someone is playing drums. Isn't that great? You know, who cares, <laughs> right? But um, once you crank it up, it's great. And then you can mess with the release time. Uh, you know, it'll it'll kind of pump and breathe. And if you get it in time with the way the drummer's playing, it can be really cool. Yeah, that's a cool thing about discovering that with compression and attack and release times is when you realize that it, who gives a shit about the science? It's literally a musical choice. You're just looking for the setting that sounds musical with the rhythm of the guitar or with the rhythm of the drums anyway. Yeah. If I knew the science, I might give a shit about it, but since I don't have the first clue, I just turn it till it sounds good. Nice. Um, what about room mics? What are some things that um, maybe tend to need to happen to room mics or places where people make mistakes with room mics? Well, I, I was talking to somebody the other day and they said something, a student, and they said something that I thought was a little bit strange. They said that they were... They had a friend that would take the room mics and like visually line up the transient from the room mic with the rest of the drum kit, which makes no sense to me at all um, because that's not the way room mics sound good. Although maybe that was a the sound they were going for. I'm not going to say it sounds bad. I'm, I'm just going to say it never occurs to me. Um, I will say this, and this works in the box or out of the box. Every time I track rooms, um, specifically just like coals close to a drum kit, I'll run it through a Chandler TG1. And I'll run it through um, an Elysia envelope. The en- Can we just have a, a moment of silence for the Chandler TG1? <laughs> it's so awesome. It's so awesome. I wish I had one here. I, I wish I had everything that Wade makes because he's amazing and all of his stuff sounds great. Um, uh, but the the really the fun thing is the Chandler gives it attitude and then the envelope, um, which is basically a transient designer on steroids, lets you, with one knob, the sustain knob, you can go from Fleetwood Mac to Led Zeppelin, you know, with one knob. So, I'm sorry, say that again. It's the envelope. What, what is the envelope? Uh, it's a it's an envelope filter. It's kind of like a transient designer, except okay. it has a little bit more control. But All I've right. just found this one particularly just sounds amazing on drum rims. Um, and these are both outboard pieces of gear, or are these also plugins? I use these when I'm tracking, but also they're, I mean, they're outboard, I mean, they're, they're plugins too, so you can use them when they're mixing. Is that from UAD or something like that? You know, I don't know who does the Elysia stuff. It may be Dirk, oh, yeah, Elysia, uh, BX, yeah. you know, um, or maybe Plugin Alliance. Oh, an um, envelope is from Elysia. Yeah. Okay, cool. What about Chandler? Do you know? Is that, I, I, I guess we could just go, never mind, we'll Google it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, fortunately, the, I mean, the new Pro Tools, thank God, lets you search by name. So you can just like click and start typing Chandler and all your Chandler stuff comes up, which is yeah. awesome. Yeah, awesome. I'm sure it's UAD. I mean, everything they do is They make some great stuff, for sure. Incredible. Um, Okay, cool. Um, What about reverbs for the drums? I mean, uh, like I'm going to pick a track that you did. Um, How fast am I going to pick it? Because it's not written down in front of me. Um, Colony House, You and I, that song. Oh, yeah. Super cool, really awesome, like bold drums. Um, I'm not sure what the treatments are there or if it's, clever use of looping once a sound is captured. But I imagine sometimes you need to put a little bit more of a space around the snare or the kick or whatever. Um, what tips do you have for creating, you know, the the bigger... The spatial thing? Yeah, the bigger spatial thing around you snare. You know, um, I don't 
really ever remember specifics, but I will say the Colony House drums are. I mean, one of the one of the brothers is the drummer, like, and he's a badass. So um, those were all real drums, not according to the singer in the video. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> which I showed to my my daughter. I was like, oh, you got to see this, and she she steps over just as the drummer smashes the singer in the face with the ride symbol, and it was, yeah. she was like, oh my god. Well, they're brothers. That's awesome. They're brothers. So, and then I told her the stories of when I had actually been in the studio producing a record, and the drummer and the bass player and the band members had actually done that same. Are stuff actually fighting. Too. Yeah, yeah. It's always fun. Um, I don't really use reverb on drums much at all, um, but if I do, it's probably just on the snare drum. With the rare occasion when you need to kind of put drums into like a room, which is usually mellower type stuff. And then the the uh, the UAD Ocean Way thing is like a really cool tool where right. you can make it sound that like there's kind of a little bit of an ambience around stuff if it was cut too dry. But most of the time if I use reverb, it's um it's a uh it's just on the snare. And sometimes it's just on a snare trigger. Uh in fact I'll take you know, I'll take a sample and just send it to a reverb because I don't want the hi hat bleed in it and the kick drum and all of that stuff. I just want it to right. to trigger. Or I'll take um, I'll take the uh, there's a plugin called Drum Leveler. Oh yeah, um, which is super cool. Is that the new one from Sound Sonics Radix? Or or Sound Radix, maybe. Oh, yeah, right, right, right. Um, and it's a really great way to clean up kicks and snares, but it's also really cool to like clean up rooms or if somebody cut like a plate or a chamber along with the drums and let it kind of trigger or pump off the kick or the snare, you know, or the kick and the snare, and it makes it kind of its own reverb without having to use an artificial reverb. Nice. Yeah. Um, and I've seen people do tricks like that where you just, you actually put a gate on the room sound or whatever or on an ambient mic and you just kind of gate it to Yeah, key open, it from a snare just sample. Just key it from a snare sample. If you're going to do that, you know, a lot of times I'll take a snare sample, I'll send, I'll send that to the key input of the gate on the room and then, I'll um I'll hit the plus sign and advance the snare in time, you know, so that it opens the room with the snare instead of the snare hitting and then the room opening. Right, right. You know, so and you, you have can to pre-delay it. In the yeah, and you can change the way it sounds like significantly by doing that, which is really cool. Yeah, um, I sort of wish that was built into the Pro Tools, so you didn't have to actually duplicate a track and shift it backwards. I wish that they had a polarity button built into every channel. Of I kind of wish that often. Yeah, me too. Um, it'd be nice. You know why else it would be nice? Because then you wouldn't accidentally delete the polarity you had decided upon when you removed the, totally. the trim plugin by accident. Later. You know what? And they could do it. It doesn't even need to be a button. Just give me a key combination where I can click the name of the track and it turns purple instead of gray or whatever, and then yeah. you know it's polarity inverted. Yeah, good point. Um, all right, cool. So let's go over to bass. Um, bass. What's some stuff? Bass is the place. What What's some stuff that's fun to do or smart to try out on a uh, electric bass guitar in a mix? Uh, well, again, parallel compression. Um, when I'm in analog world, I use an RCA BA25 which is an old tube compressor that probably has enough gain in it to like light up your house. Um, so you got to be careful with it. You got to pad it. Um, uh, when I am in the box, I use the El Rey. Have you messed with that thing? Not yet. The El no, Rey compressor. Is that the one that mimics the... BA6A, basically. Okay, yeah. Yeah, BA6A. which is in the same family as the BA25. Um, so that's always on a parallel. Um, I, parallel... Gives a really nice character to bass, and I also usually parallel like a fab filter. <sighs> what is it? The Saturn? They have like a distortion filtering thing. Yeah, it's, it's red. Um, yeah, what is it? Um, <laughs> I think it's Saturn. It might be yeah, Saturn. I think um, it is Saturn. Yeah, as in for saturate. As a parallel, though. Yeah, for for, for saturation. Um, so, what about this, man? I mean, that using stuff like the El Rey and the RCA five A twenty five. Those strike me as good moves for when the bass itself is already well done and well played. But I so often run into a bass track that, like, you know, might be played in a way where the bass player was sort of clueless about what needed to sound good coming out of the speakers. Yeah. Um, not as a diss on them, but just like maybe they just couldn't even hear it in the context of sitting in the drums and the control on the out there or whatever. Or maybe the amp was just too far away sure, to dial sure. it in just right. So are there some 
things that might be helpful as far as like, um, let's say you've got a base part and it's just way too muddy and you need to bring out more definition to make it cut through a rock band. Any, any good tips there? Yeah. I mean, I, there's stuff that's always pretty much on my base channel that I turn on and off. Um, and it goes, if I can remember correctly, it goes like this. Um, Sound Toys Echo Boy, which when you turn off the delay is a really cool saturation processor with a lot of options and a lot of character. That thing is so deep. It's unbelievable. I love if you that turn off the delay, then it's sort of real time. It's in it's in phase. It's in now. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it, wor- it works great. I mean, there's tons of options for that thing. Um, and then Sansamp. Sansamp is the best thing ever on bass. Like, it, it's great. And there's so many different tones and stuff you can get. I'll run it through Vintage Warmer by PSP. I'll run it through the Aphex plugin from, I think it's from Digi, like from Avid. Um, that that can give a very little bit of that can give some really nice clarity. Um, you know, I'll carve out low end with the fab filter. Um, and then uh, one of my favorite tricks uh, is um, take the tube tech EQs, right? I think I think that's soft tube. Mm-hmm. It might be plug in alliance. I think so. All right. So take the tube tech EQ and the tube tech limiter. Set up the tube tech limiter to be, you know. I mean, again, if you if you reach out to me or I can send you pictures on show notes, but um, the 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 gist of it is is the the limiter is kind of a slow attack, kind of a fast release, like like most of the times you use that. Um, but the the trick is is the the EQ before the limiter take a hundred hertz and one point five k and dime them all the way up. Push that into the limiter and let the limiter chill it out, you know, because it's going to be kind of banging. And that can can that can literally take a like a, a lethargic sounding bass and just light it up. That's an old trick that I stole from an old mentor of mine, a guy named Rick Will that I assisted for years. And Rick, right I mean, on. he always used to do that in in analog. We, we would pull out the tube tech, and the first thing he'd do is like all the way up on a hundred, all the way up on one and a half k. I awesome. remember remembering correctly. Rick Will was iodine or no. Uh, he recorded and mixed iodine. Okay. Uh, iodine was Jay Joyce's band. Oh, Jay Joyce's Jay band. Jay and Chris okay, and Doug, that's yeah. Right, that's right. Cool. Um, all right, so then um, what about the, uh, do you know the Nembrini Sansamp plugin? The the PSA 1000 is a new new one? No, those are all, that. that's a word I've never, I don't think I've ever heard the word Nembrini before. I, I can't believe I remembered it just now, but I had a good long time between I when I thought of it down. a moment ago and just said it out you loud. You got to email me that. All right, I'll, I will. But so so that was one that, um, it's a Sansamp emulator plugin that when I compare it, you know, back to back, it does sound a little better to me. Oh, cool. It's nice to hear. And then um, I think I saw Chad Blake had posted about it on Facebook or something. If Chad like, Blake cool. uses it, then it's it's got to be amazing. Yeah, and it has a built-in um, uh, phase inversion too. Oh, that's always convenient. Yeah, so so it's pretty pretty useful. And a blend knob, so you don't have to, you don't have to nice too. put it on a separate channel. I think every plugin should have a blend knob. They probably should. They should. Should we have a blend knob? Yes. All right. Absolutely. Um, okay, let's see. Anything else? Um, I do remember once here in Jakir talk about um, widening bass in mixes, and I wondered if that was a practice that was was useful to you as well. well Jakir or? doesn't know what he's doing, so we shouldn't <laughs> listen to that at all. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, widening bass, uh, I actually have, I have, um, so when I have my bass, it's usually bass DI, bass amp. Right, I combine those down to one track that's got some of the plugins that we were talking about. How do we do that the smart way and not the dumb way? Yeah, combining? that's that is actually key. So you know, always check polarity. We should actually just make T-shirts that say "Always check polarity." Um, ACP. Yeah, ACP. the 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 key there is using like the uh, the Little Labs plugin. Um, yeah, I wish I don't have it yet. I need it. That it it's. I, you can just feel the genius of Jonathan Little like flowing through that thing. I, I mean, theoretically, you could be able to fix that stuff with like delay, you know, sample delay or stuff. But for whatever reason, that thing just makes it so much easier and sounds so much better. I don't know. It's just, you know, make sure you're, make sure the bases that people are cutting are lined up. It makes a huge difference, huge difference. You know, check the time, check the polarity. Make sure that happens. And then I have the, like I said, I have the parallel compressor. I have the parallel distortion. And then I'll also have, um, it's probably labeled bass love or whatever. And it's going through like a micro 
pitch shift, it's like a harmonizer or through the just echo. Just giving us some lows or yeah, something? Yeah, the sound, no, the sound toys, sorry, the sound toys, like, um, sorry, I'm, I'm spacing on the name of it. It's a, it's a chorus. Right. Okay, you know, like yeah. a stereo chorus. Yeah. Um, and just sneak a little bit of that in, and sometimes that just opens the bass up in the stereo spectrum a little bit. Are there any danger zones about widening your bass? Do you do you need to make sure that the wide part sort of doesn't have the lowest frequencies in it or anything like that? Or is that just, am I putting on my science brain too much? I don't know. You know, it's probably not a bad idea to just filter out the low frequency on that on that chain because why muck it up? But it's also a good idea to, to look at low frequency on just about everything, you know, you're, yeah. you know, if your bass has like a ton of low frequency at 20 hertz, you don't need that. You know, look at the fundamentals. Like, pick a place. Yeah. You can't have all the kick drum energy and all the bass energy at the same time. You know, like one's got to give. So let me ask you this, man. Um, in some of, in going back and looking at some of your favorite old records that inspired you and made you feel great about music, were you shocked to discover some things about low end or anything like that? Well, I mean, we're definitely in an age right now where there's a lot more low end on records, and some of that is because now we have equipment that lets the low end pass that we right. didn't have. We have we have an instrument that will play it. Yeah, um, you know, we can you know, Pro Tools passes you know theoretically DC to light, right? Like um, you know, an old tape machine won't. Uh, so, but again, you know, as we were talking about the drum kit being an instrument, I think the the kick drum and the bass guitar are kind of an instrument also. Um, so you have to pay attention to how those two things work together because when you're playing, especially with great musicians, they are an instrument. They're a unified instrument. Yeah, and <laughs> I know what the opposite is. Or not like. a unified <laughs> instrument. <laughs> and it's a really funny thing because as, when I'm in a production capacity, I find myself wanting to, struggling sometimes because I want to guide the bass player and the drummer to understand that if they don't already understand it. And it's totally reasonable to not understand it because I remember not understanding it and then beginning to understand sure. it later, you know. But at the same time, I, lo I look at him like, but, you know, I mean, maybe not playing, you know, the kick and this bass together every time. Maybe, maybe it's cool to do different stuff. And so it's always like, where do you guide people? Um, what are some ways that you like to, well, maybe you don't have to guide musicians who don't know what they're doing anymore. Well, no, I mean, it's, it's, every session's different. Yeah. We're, we're incredibly privileged and spoiled, frankly, to work in Nashville where the quality of musicians is so high that, you know, the, the hardest job is to just stay out of their way. Yeah. You know, cause they're amazing. But yeah. no, I mean, it's, it's, it's tough when you're working with a band, you know, you have to balance trying to get what you want with you telling them that could make them think about, the kick drum and the bass notes so much that they stop performing right, and exactly. it just gets horrifyingly bad. Yeah. You know, so, and you're right. They don't always have to be together. I mean, think about it. If James Jamerson, if there was a kick drum for every note James Jamerson played, it would sound like a blast beat. No doubt. <laughs> James Jamerson definitely broke all those rules. Oh my gosh. But it's such incredible work, you know? Yeah. Like but do, do we have a lot of kick on those? We had two snares on a lot of those. Yeah. Not a ton. No. You know? Um, all right, cool. So, you know, I, I guess one takeaway for that is sometimes I just try and instead of, you know, being careful not to tell musicians what to do, but point out some things that they might want to take a look at themselves. Yeah. You know, Especially like, if it just, if it makes the song better yeah. um, or makes their part better, you know, it's always a fine line. Yeah. All right, cool. So let's uh, move on. Well, what, anything else for bass we want to think about? Is there anything for gluing the kick and the um, bass or the drums and the bass together? Any particular moves? That I don't are use any. Like I know people. There are people that like side chain stuff. I have never really found that useful. Maybe once in a blue moon. Usually when the the kick or the low end has something to do with an eight hundred eight, and you want the uh, right. you want the attack to come through, but you don't want the sustained them like mug the rest of the beat or whatever. So you can kind of mess around with that. But usually I don't do much. <laughs> Want to record killer drums in your home studio? Then check out Rockstars of Drums to learn how to record, edit, and mix pro-sounding drums with a professional Nashville session drummer in a Grammy-winning studio. Or if you're ready to start mastering your own records at home, then check out Rockstars of Mastering, where I walk you through exactly how I mastered my own records, Skadoosh, using nothing but plugins in PreSona Studio One. And if mixing is your focus, then check out my free course, Mix Master Bundle, where I show you how to mix 
mix using stock and free plugins in Pro Tools. And the best part is these techniques would work for you in whichever DAW you're using right now. Plus, you get a look at how I recorded everything in my studio and multi-track downloads for you to practice mixing and even include in your mixing portfolio if you want. Are you ready to make your best record ever? Then go to Mix Master Bundle to get started for free now or look for the clickable link in the show notes of this episode. You know, it's funny. I think about disco and how uh, how right the bass and the kick were yeah. back then. But, I mean, I don't think they were using any side chain tricks. I don't think they were. But you know what they may have been doing is, you can try this too, is feed your bass into your drum parallel. Right, so that it just breathes a little bit with, yeah. the, with yeah. the compression and see, on both. and see how that works. I actually used to do that, and then I started removing it from there. And maybe I just need to, maybe you just need to have buttons where you can send a little bit of it, anything to anywhere and see what yeah. it does. I mean, one... One thing that's great is having all that set up. So you just, you know, you have a parallel and you can mute it or unmute it with a click of a button and and just see, you know. So part of the way to do that is to do you use aug sends on track. So the bass would have mm-hmm. an aug send over to the parallel um, drum compression track, for example. Yeah. Um, and then do you find that, let me think about this, that the, the parallel is, let's say there's a sub augs, a submix augs track for the drums, mm-hmm. and then there's a submix augs track for the parallel compression. Um, do you do those ever have the same input, or are they always separate inputs? Does that make sense? Uh, I mean, they're probably they're always separate inputs because just taking taking that fader to zero makes it the same input. Right. You know? yeah. And there's a key command in Pro Tools where you can just like select all these drum mics and be like, mirror this to send A and boom, then right. you've got like right. an equal thing. Yeah. And that's, it used to be a little bit more of a pain in the butt. Than it that. did. Yeah. <laughs> You'd have to manually try and duplicate a, a mix in the AUGS mix. Totally. Um, all right. Let's move on to guitars. Yeah. Um, let's talk about electric guitars for just a sec. Okay. So electric guitars is one of the areas that I really like having analog stuff around. Um, I love using uh, SSL EQ on electric guitars, and I love using LA3As. That being said, I use the UAD LA3A on tons of guitars, and here's another fun thing to try. Open the UAD LA3A plugin and turn both of the knobs all the way to the right. Then put that on guitars. Nine times out of ten, it'll work really, really well. Uh, Sometimes a guitar will be so transient that the transient will come through like really harshly, and you got to deal with that. And sometimes there'll be so much noise on the guitar that as the note rings out, the noise just gets obscene. So you can either try and knock it out with Isotope RX, or you know you can just like fade it. But you know, and I, I you may see a common theme on this. Like I I don't think that I got really good at mixing until I stopped being afraid of doing really extreme stuff. Right. So you know, like the default setting for my UAD LA three A is both knobs all the way to the right. Dig it. You know, I like that. And it's a really great sound. So um, I, a lot of times with electrics, I'm doing analog EQ into LA3A, but if I'm in the box, then then uh, uh, I use it in the box. And then that generally, at least for the main, like the rock electric guitars, um, that feeds an aux. Like they go to an aux, and on that is... Um, okay, so here goes Secret Weapon, right? Nice. BX Shred Spread. Got it. Awesome plugin. It is awesome. There is a, I'm sure there's like 12 different things on it. I use one. There's the knob that's the width knob and actually two. There's a width thing and there's a, I think it's called shred. Yeah, shred or gain or something like that. So shred isn't what you think. The more you turn it up, like the more wooly and mellow they get. But a little bit of that especially when you're EQing maybe a little too much 7K into it, and then you chill it out with that. And then the spread, I just turn it out to about like 130, you know? And it just kind of moves the main rock guitars out in the speakers and like keeps them away from interfering with stuff. Uh, It works really, really well. So in order to do that, um, Rockstars, you would have to take the two tracks, pan them to a stereo bus, and then put the shed shed spread the shit spreader. Spread, shit, <laughs> shred. <laughs> shit spreader Sorry, Dirk. On on the stereo augs return, yeah. right? So that they're like so Yeah, you just call it or, call it like yeah. your rock guitar bus, right? I I'll yeah. put I'll yeah. put that on it. Um a lot of times I'll use the UAD thermionic culture vulture. Culture vulture yeah. yeah, that can add a little bit of of distortion, like angst, 
to guitars, which sometimes when you listen to it soloed, you're like, man, that's way too much distortion. But when you sneak it in in the mix, it just makes the guitars a little ballsier. Um, a lot of times I'll also kick like a PSP vintage warmer on guitars because you oh, can- Oh yeah, the PSP vintage warmer. It's that's so a good. Cool one. Yeah, you can tell it like, hey, I want you to distort like the upper mid range and leave the rest of it alone, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, it's just ways to shape the guitar sound. It has a great compression too. It really does. Like that plugin is a is a hidden secret, man. In fact, I just walked into uh, uh, Pete Lyman's studio today. He was, whatever he was mastering and vintage warmer was up there. I was like, dude, vintage warmer. He's like, yeah, man, it was just perfect for this song. That's groovy, man. Um, all right, so uh, let's see. What else? What else? What else? Um, Acoustics. How about, wait, no, before keys, we get there, let's vocals. talk about the solo. <laughs> let's talk about the solo. The guitar solo. The guitar solo. How is, that, how is that one handled differently than those big guitars that we just, you know, got to rock with the band? Yeah, I mean, it just, it just depends. Like, for solos, I like to try and put it in a little bit of a different space. So sometimes it's a combination of things. Sometimes it's throwing the Waves Eddie Kramer guitar plug in on it and just pressing buttons until it sounds cool. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of times I'll give it some sort of, sometimes I've run it through like two H3000 plugins, just anything that gives it a different space. So when the solo hits, it's a scene change, it's like a shift in what's going on. Um, is that's a big thing for me. Like sometimes it's crystallizer, just throwing some weird, yeah. swirly stuff out. Um, thank God for sound toys. Thank God for sound toys, man. Those guys are just Ken's a genius, and they've just been so good for so long. I, you know, it's there. There, uh, there's a couple of companies that um, whose stuff I use so much. It's just like, can I just buy a lifetime, like, you know, lifetime membership? Yeah, you know, I mean, it's like just Valhalla. Take my money. Everything can is I just cool. Buy a burial plot, at right? Your, at I know. Plucking company. Um, so you know the. The guitar solo thing, I'll tell you what I use a lot. PSP makes a thing called a, I mean, they make a mix pack or whatever. And one of the things they have in it is called a stereo controller, right? And it's a weird plugin that lets you steer stuff around stereo. So what I like to do on guitar solos is I'll push it a little extra stereo, and then I'll take the center and or the balance, and I'll move it a little bit to the side, right? Um, Sometimes a lot to the side, but a lot of times it's a little bit to the to the side because the vocals coming up the middle um as yeah. and as an aside in this this case as an exception but most of the time my I'm the panning that I'm using is left center or right right on okay. everything but um so you want to kick the guitar solo just slightly out so that if there's a vocal coming into it or coming out of it you know it's kind of off the vocal it doesn't mask it you know it gives it a little bit of different thing you know it's uh, again it's anything to make it different yeah yeah um and that's one of the things is, you know, sometimes it's tricky when that that lead guitar tone, maybe maybe the guitar player used a pretty similar one to what the rhythm track was done with or something like that. Yeah, in that case, then just go ahead and screw it up. I run stuff through pedals a lot, Yeah, like just plugging in a guitar pedal. I run bass through pedals a lot. Um, run the guitar through a pedal, run it through an amp and mic the amp or... or Any good tips for getting the signal out of your computer into a pedal and back in? I just use the radial. Um Radial DI, DI box. I don't know what's called. It's orange. Right. Okay. You cool. know, and yeah. it's the inner, it matches I, the inner. I'm like that too, man. I can't even remember the yeah. names of stuff. No, anymore. it's orange. I mean, Little Labs makes it makes a killer one that that um that will also like cook you breakfast. Um, I I have the radial one that is just within easy reach, and it's a really easy way to run out to a tape delay or to a guitar, you know, a pedal or anything that you can screw No, is it a box with. that you you go out through the box and come back in through the same box? Yeah. Or not? Yep. Okay. Yeah, in and out. That's handy. That's where it gets a little tricky sometimes when you're like, I want to do this thing and you're like, oh crap, which cable do I need to go from what to this to Yeah, that, I just that? leave it set up. You know, there's a bunch of pedals on the right-hand side of my studio so I can just put an insert in and go over and just start plugging in pedals until something sounds cool. Yeah, I need to set that up in here. Um, okay, awesome. So let's move to acoustic guitars. What's what's lovely about acoustic guitars? Acoustic guitars, you know, I probably should have brought pictures for some of this. Uh, acoustic guitars, a lot of times, almost all the time, they're always in the box through a bus. Um, and does it make me crazy that I I almost have to look at my session to remember what I'm doing? The one thing no, that I, I... I always do. So there's a Neve VR. What do you think I'm asking all the questions yeah, and not right. giving all the answers? <laughs> right. We can put this in the show notes. There's a Neve VR. UAD makes a Neve VR or 88R plugin or whatever. And so there's an old trick if you ever used to work on the VR Neves, which is you take the um, you take the high end, um, uh, the shelf, you know, 
and you crank it up like a good 10 dB or whatever. And then you take the, the low pass filter and you turn it down. And it makes a really weird interaction that's perfect for acoustic guitars because it's not like super searingly bright, but it's open. Yeah. Um, uh, and then uh, recently, like they literally just released this, uh, UAD released an Avalon 737 plugin. Right. And in real life, I, I, you know, a lot of us, the 737 was like the go-to for hip hop and R&B and, and rap vocals. Like you never really thought about using it on the mix, but it's got a 32K EQ on it. And 32K on, a, on acoustics is amazing. Like crank it all the way open on your acoustics and you will very quickly discover whether your recording chain is actually recording stuff above, you know, 15K like or 12K. Um, because sometimes you dime it and nothing happens. And sometimes you dime it and the whole thing just opens up. And it's not actually EQ, really. It's air. You know, right, right. You know, it's uh it's pretty amazing. Like I just I just uh I was just demoing it out and I, I found out that it's on like a hundred things, which means I'm screwed. Like I'm gonna have to buy it because it's on like twelve <laughs> songs now on like tw- you know, ten tracks on each song. Now what is you now I, I seem to recall that the mog EQ is is known for that too, the air band and stuff like that. Do it you is. ever use that on acoustics? Uh, I don't actually. I end up using the Neve a lot. I end up using... Um, I guess the Mog doesn't have the high cut as well or the low pass. It doesn't, yeah. And I suppose you could, if you had the Mog, you could use that and then do a high cut in another in another EQ. Guess you'll have to experiment and find out. Yeah. Um, here's an oldie but a goodie. On almost all of my acoustics, I use Massey tape head. Uh, Massey tape is very cool. I used Super to use cool. it like crazy. I haven't been using it as much now, but I probably need to keep using it. I love it on acoustics. I love the um, the UAD Shadow Hills on acoustics. Uh, PSP makes uh, a geeky plugin called Mix Treble that lets you mess around with harmonics and saturation stuff like that. That sounds really good on acoustics. And then um, who are the guys that make? Um, they modify the Fatso, and then they make this. Clarifonic EQ Kush. So let's jump to you know the thing that may or may not be the most important part of right. a, a song and a mix is the vocals. <laughs> it is definitely the most what, important. What tips do you want to share for um you know we're getting near the end here too, but what what do you want to share for getting vocals to sound cool? Like what should we try in our mixes? Uh, as when when it comes to the vocal, you should try everything because if the vocal doesn't sound awesome or unique or uh, exciting or emotional, then the rest of it really doesn't matter. Because let's face it, I mean, honestly, other than the bass player and the bass player's girlfriend, the people like people out in 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 the real world are predominantly listening to the vocal. You know, because yeah. they listen to music because music speaks to them, and a lot of times that speaks to them through a lyric. So you have to make sure the vocal is great. All right, so that means trying everything we Any, might anything. learn. So yeah. like minimal, maximal. This is one thing that I have actually learned. Like, you just do not give up on the vocal. If it's not working, try something else. If that's not working, try something else. If that's not working, distort it. You know, you just have to keep going. So I do weird stuff on vocals, and I use a lot of outboard on vocals, a lot. Um, You know, but the the theory remains the same. um, I'll do initial EQ on a vocal. I'll make sure that rumble is gone. You know, I'll make sure if there's peaks in like 19K, 20K, you can see them sometimes on Fab Filter. Get rid of that too. You don't need that. What about things like clip gain, making sure that that there's a unity of level or anything like that? I will do that later, um, you know, with rides or with clip gain. Um, but if, uh, I mean, you have to assume that the vocalist was performing it for a reason and the, right. you know, the producer was was having that performance for a reason. So the last thing I want to do is take dynamics out of it preemptively. Right. Um, but then a lot of times I'll run it through, I'll run it through Phoenix, Crane Songs Phoenix, um, to give it a little character. And then I usually send it out to a couple of um, a couple of different compressors. So do this. Set up like five or six different channels and put different compressors on them. LA-2A, 1176, uh, Neve, um, like whatever, your favorite compressors and run the vocal through all of those and, and get them doing all kinds of different stuff. And some are smashing in, it, some are riding in, it. Take yeah. them out, see what sounds good. And what, what I've found is that it's it's not as much about the dynamics as it is about the character that the compressor gives to the vocal. I do this with outboard compressors, but you can do it in the box. And I combine multiple compressors to get character on the vocal. 
You know, sometimes an 1176 will put a brightness in it. If you combine that with an LA-2A that has like some darkness or some thickness to it, then like they they kind of combine to make a really exciting vocal kind of yeah. thing. Um, I'll do that a lot and I'll run that whole chain. Then when I pick the blend, that'll go through a Pultec or a Neve 1073 EQ or, um, you know, like a, a, a compressor, an outboard compressor I use a lot as a GML, um, which really sounds amazing on vocals. I still don't know how the thing works, really. I mean, I think there's like there's like three people on earth that know how that works. And two Is George of, one of them? Two of them are George. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it sounds amazing on vocals. Um, and then anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll bring that back into the box and then all bets are off, man. I'll, I'll put... I'll put retro color on it. I'll put um, GRM bandpass on it. I'll put uh, Kazrog. The Kazrog plugin shows up on vocals more often than not. I'll add another compressor. Uh, Metric Halo channel strip is really cool. Like you know, interesting. Yeah, um, I've got that one. But every time I look at, it, I'm like, ah, oh, this looks like a lot of knobs for me to. It is a lot of knobs. Through. So try this. Just just bring it up on vocals and take the limiter knob and turn it all the way to the left, and okay. see what happens. Dig it. Probably have to turn down the output a little bit. All right. Um, you know, there's a bunch of different, like literally I'll try anything. Um, and then sometimes when you're, when you've got vocals that really need some help, you know, you duplicate the vocal track, you take everything out except like 12 K and above, you obliterate it with a limiter and then you flip it out of phase and bring it in slowly underneath the other, like the main vocal. And that can give a sparkle and can actually fix distortion problems, which I don't know why, cause it's actually more distortion, but you know, it can it can definitely give a character to the vocal. Well, maybe it was um, Richard Dodd who said, "Like, how do you hide an elephant? You put it in a room, a room full, full of, of elephants." elephants. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I mean, all bets are off on vocals. Um, I usually have my, I usually have a template set up where under the vocal, the first thing that's under the vocal is one or two tracks called throw, and the throw tracks will have Echo Boy on them at like a quarter. And an eighth note delay, and maybe some Brower spatialization. When you on say it tracks, or, they're they're an audio track. Literally or audio tracks. So yeah. it's the same vocal. It's just on a new audio. No, it's track. not. They're just empty. And what okay. they're there for is they're there to be like delays. So if I'm going along and I hear like a, a repeat on a note, I can literally just highlight that note, copy it down to that track. Boom! Now I have a delay. Yeah. Um, That's a great tip. I, I think I heard Vance mention something about that at one point too. Yeah, I can't imagine you guys have any of the same uh, techniques. You know, being buddies and living in the same town. <laughs> but <laughs> I, but everything I, tried I know, it. I stole from Vance. <laughs> I tried it. You know, as I was doing a, uh, a new song with my my friends, and I was like, "Oh, we need to land the thing." And I was like, "Tried that thing," and sure enough, it yeah. totally worked. It was it, it was so much easier yeah. than. I don't know, whatever complicated way I used to do it, trying to write a bunch of automation and things like that. Well, yeah, I mean, that's and that's the one with the vocal delays. It's really fun to use audio because then when you have audio, you can take that little bit of audio and quickly clip gain it or slip it or put, you know, uh, uh, the the clip EQ on it and like mess with it really, really fast. Yeah. Where you're not going to have to sit there and, okay, now I got to make an aux. Now I got to put the fader up. Now I got to automate the mute and turn the mute on for this one. No, man, just pull it down to a, Pull it down to a track that's got cool shit on it. Yeah, it's a good reminder. Like, we're in the digital world with DAWs now. Just because we can get really complicated with things doesn't mean that's the, the direction you need to keep going. It's like, keep making the the uh, the choice and the, the action of going after something as simple as possible. Yeah, well, I mean, from even further altitude than that, like, you want to be in a creative flow. I don't want to sit there and be listening to a vocal and feel something and have to stop and think and open this aux and create that and put a delay on it and dial the delay to this and maybe add an EQ and then go back and let no. I just literally as the as it rolls by there and there's this one word like yo, 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 I'll literally just grab that word, copy it down, and you know, the next time the song goes by, that section I can hear it and see how it hits me. You know, I don't want to get out of the creative flow. Yeah, I'm with you on that. The same with vocal effects. Like I have one vocal effect aux send. That goes to probably 12 channels of varying kinds of EQ, rooms, plates, weird shit, space echoes, like all of that stuff. And, you know, I'll just, I'll push that fader up and I'll go through and just mute and unmute stuff until something sounds cool. Awesome. Um, how about, uh, let's see. So you you took the vocal, you did all this parallel stuff. Now, I 
think you were saying, like, especially if it's outside of the box, are you bringing it all back in on a, often on a single new track or anything like that? Um, Is that kind of a good takeaway? It's like, do anything, but at the end of this thing, try and deal with one thing. Yeah, I think so. I think it's easier to, it's easier to do that. It's easier to ride it, you know? Yeah. When you've only got. Well, I, I definitely have an easier time riding or, or just telling where I am if I can literally see the waveform on yep. the screen. If it's an AUGS fader and it's just a line with dots all over it, I get really confused. Totally. And that's a, and, and another thing that we do a ton is um, because I am fortunate enough to be able to have an assistant, like he sets up my songs and everything is color coded. Right. Like, and everything is laid out exactly the same way. So I know if I'm listening to a song and I'm like, you know, actually listening to the, how everything's working and I know something needs to change for acoustic guitars, I know about halfway through the scroll in light blue are the acoustics and I can go right there. Yeah. You know, which doesn't make a huge difference when it's a band, but when it's 450 tracks, it makes a huge difference. Yeah, indeed. Well, it still makes a difference even for me. Just, just, I get, I get confused so easily. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> basically what it boils down to. Um, awesome, dude. Well, this has been really cool, man. Let's let's go to some closing questions. Yeah. Um, what about referencing? What's one of the ways that you like to make sure that your mixes sort of stand up against your favorite mixes from other people? And you just listen. You know, it's it's a it's a little bit of an ego crush sometimes, but it really is important to sit there and listen. And it's also important to be in touch with your clients, man. I, I just. I just did a record, um, which turned out great and shall remain nameless. But they sent me a song and they didn't say anything. So I mixed it kind of pop because it was kind of poppy, sparse but poppy. And then they came back and they were like, oh, well, you know, what we really wanted, we wanted to sound like it was 50 years old. Right. Right. And I was like, oh, okay, no problem. And we whipped, you know, we broke out the EMT 140 plate and like the old Neve compressors and like all of this old stuff. And I sent it to them like that. And they were like, this is exactly what we wanted. And it's like, that's cool. If you had told me that ahead of time, like, you know, if you want this to sound like this Drake song, tell me you want it to sound like this Drake right. song. You know? Right. Communication. And I, yeah. And I I mean, I get that people are like, man, I just want to let you do your thing. It's like, I'm still going to do my thing. But if you've been listening to this reference for like the past six weeks, I need to hear it. Yeah. You know, just like I always, always, always want the rough mix. Yep. For two so. reasons. One, okay. this is what they're used to. Three reasons. One, it's what they're used to. Two, it's probably loud as fuck, so you got to deal with that when you're sending out like mixes. And three, um, it's a really quick way to make sure that you got everything. Because nothing is more frustrating than sending in a mix and then being like, those aren't the right guitars. Right. And you're like, oh. So Where's you always the check piano? the rough mix. Yeah. A lot of times I'll listen to the rough mix and I'll be like, we're missing this. Like, where is that thing? And they're like, oh, sorry, forgot to send it. Right. You know? So you always got to have the rough mix. But yeah, referencing all referencing great mixes is going to do is make you better at mixing. When is the right time and the wrong time to reference though in the process? I don't, I mean, I don't know. I, I, it's, if somebody has a reference, I'll listen to it first. I'll listen to their rough mix. I'll listen to their reference. And then during the process, I'll, I'll double check, like drag it into the session, line it up, pop back and forth. You know, it's going to be hard to compare, but if you get the volumes relatively even, then at least it gives you kind of some perspective and, if you get lost and you're doing something stupid and then you switch it over to the reference and the vocal's like a hundred times brighter or a hundred times darker, it kind of gives you a reality check or a reset. All right. So um, let's, let's go to this kind of closing question here. When are we done with the mix? Man, hopefully you're done before you go over the, the peak of the mountain and start to slip down the other side. Um, it's a very slippery other side. It can isn't it? be, yeah. And I, I mean, I've, I've been, I've been there. I've done that myself. Um, and one of the hardest things to do is to admit to yourself that you did that, and you go back to where you were. Um, which, by the way, go into Pro Tools, go to the auto save, set it to nine hundred ninety nine, and every minute, because there's no reason not to. Yeah, that's what I, I, I don't have it that high, but I will now. <laughs> um, uh. I don't know when the mix is done. Sometimes it just feels done or when there's nothing else to do. I, I'm more and more, I'm really a big fan of like mixing it till I think it's done, putting it away and starting another song and then coming back to that song with fresh ears. Like maybe it's a couple hours later or maybe it's first thing in the morning, you know? And it's like the, have you ever had the, this happens all the time. Like you think a mix is done 
And as soon as the client walks into the room and you hit play, you hear like six things oh, yeah. that you were like, why did I do that? Like, you know, I mean, it's just, it's a part of human psychology. You have to, you have to rip yourself out of complacency. Um, I do that by switching speakers. I do that by taking ear breaks, pulling up other songs, listening to references. Like you have to, you humans tend to get inertia in a particular direction. Like you have to like forcibly remove yourself from inertia. You know, one of the things that I've experienced a lot of is bouncing your mix in real time or printing your mix in real time. And and you turn up the speakers and you step away and I walk away from the console. There's yeah. like this physical act that you always do where you're like, I'm walking away from it now. We're just listening. Definitely. And then the then whoever you're working with is like, listen, they're they're starting to get into it. And then you just walk right over and you're like, escape as soon as you hit the first <laughs> chorus. Sorry, dude. You gotta no, make a change. Gotta or, and then hopefully maybe that just the 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 hitting escape just keeps eking its way along toward the end of the song until you're finally totally finally there. And uh Hopefully you're making better moves with each other. Well, you know, a lot of times I'll also like I'll when I get towards the ending part of a mix, I'll throw it over on like some speakers over on the side of the room, and then um, I'll whip my phone out and read some news while the song's playing. Right, right. Because I know that the song's pretty much done, but something that's glaringly obvious that maybe I'm just used to will jump out when I'm not concentrating on yeah. listening. When I'm listening, like a lot of people listen, which is the music is in the background, and then like it'll hit the bridge or whatever, and then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, the solo's too low. Like, because it didn't grab my attention as I was kind of listening to it, but also kind of reading BBC News. You know? Yeah. So, and I that's mean, only because we can't actually physically drive our car in the control room. Right. Otherwise, we'd just do that. Yeah. I mean, however however it works for you. Like, I mean, whatever. Just, just uh you know, a lot of times people are listening to music in the background, and when you do that, sometimes you realize, like, oh, I really do need to turn the backgrounds up in the last chorus because it just didn't hit me. It didn't emotionally impact me. You know, I mean, distracting yourself can be useful. Yeah, I agree. I I hear things when I'm driving that are just so immediately obvious to me, and then the, then the real challenge is how do you take a note about it? I I think I read somewhere that somebody used to put a vacuum cleaner against the control room glass and run it while they listen to mixes because putting that noise into the room kind of averaged out the minutia and made the important stuff really important. Nice. I like that idea. Yeah. Um, very cool, man. Well, let's go to a closing question here. And um, you, I think you've answered this one on the last episode, but we'll, we'll ask it in a little bit of a different way. Um, if you could go back, take the studio way back machine, but maybe it's not that far back, go back to earlier in your mixing and go back and give yourself one bit of advice. Say, listen, dude, you're doing, you're doing good. Keep doing what you're doing. But here's the single most important thing you need to know to be a rock star of the studio yourself later one day. As far as mixing goes, what would you like to go back and give yourself as advice for mixing? Go forth without fear. <laughs> trust and, yourself. And I am your father. Yeah, I am your father. No, uh, I mean, trust yourself. You got you to gotta trust yourself. People are coming to you to do this because they like what you do. So don't try and second guess what they want as much as trusting yourself. Like, you know, go forth without, without fear. Because the beauty thing about mixing is no one's going to die. You know, like if somebody doesn't like the mix, you might feel like you're going to die, but you're not going to die. This isn't high risk. You know, it's not rocket surgery. So, you know, Go go forth fearless, and hopefully you'll find yourself in a lot of situations where everybody is there trying to make the best quality project, you know, that they can, which are the projects that are the most fun to work on, where everyone is there because they're good and they trust each other and they want to make the best thing possible, and uh, and that is that is so much more fun than when everyone's at each other's throats and they're all like second guessing each other and yeah. you know, it's somebody else's fault and whatever. And you know, we're humans, that's going to happen too, but you know, try and be fearless if you can, because it's, it's a, it's a much better way to go. Awesome. Well, dude, thank you so much for being on the podcast with us again, man. man thank you for having me. I, lo I love this podcast. Thank you. <laughs> well, you so rock, dude. You're, Great you're, to see you're you. my favorite fan. <laughs> um, no, sorry, Rockstars, I'm not trying to exclude anybody. No, You're all my favorites. It's, it's all inclusive. Um, let the Rockstars know where they can find out more about you. And I'm pretty sure you you now actually have some great teaching online as well that they may want to check out, right? Yeah, I, you, can, you can find me. Um, you can find me occasionally popping up on um, 
produced like a pro with our buddy Warren, um, who's a total trip and uh, and and such a sweetheart. And then Fab Dupont, um, the uh, I, I don't know. There are so many adjectives to describe Fab. Um, Magnifique. But I think maybe his name just kind of sums it up. He is yeah, completely go. Fab. Um, Pure Mix is an incredible resource of all kinds of stuff, and through some strange clerical error, they included me in all of that. So, right. uh, you know, you can look me up and a bunch of my friends on on Pure Mix and get some really, really great tips on how we dig into songs. Like specifically, a lot of the stuff that we covered, you'll you'll see on there because we just opened the session and went. Uh, we all started somewhere, and um, music education in this country is in a horrible state. So if anyone has the inclination, please check out songfarm.org. We would love to have your participation. And unfortunately, this is part of a charity. We'd love to have your money as well. So please check it out and uh, and help us get uh, get music creation tools in the hands of, uh, of kids in high schools across this country. Awesome. Um, and then you can find me on the web. If you Google Robot Lemon, you'll find me. Right so, on. Robotlemon.com. Awesome. Rockstars, thanks for listening. Reed, thanks for joining us on the show again. So good to see you, man. Elena, thanks for helping coordinate all this. Yes, Elena, Triple Eight Management. Kick ass. Thank you so much. Um, We'll see you in the next uh, episode, I guess. We'll see you around the studio. Awesome. Thanks. Cheers. Later. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever now, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my free course at mixmasterbundle.com. And if you want more free content from Recording Studio Rockstars, all you have to do is go to rsrockstars.com slash email. Again, that's rsrockstars.com slash email to enter your name and email and I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, podcast updates and even free gear giveaways for your studio. Just look for the link in the show notes below. Thanks so much for listening and thanks for being a rock star. I'm Lid Shaw and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. Thanks so much for listening to this episode, Rockstars. I also want to give a big thank you to our sponsors who helped make this episode possible. OWC, Whisper Room, Eventide Audio, Spectra 1964, and Roswell Pro Audio. You'll find links to all these wonderful sponsors in our show notes. These are all things that I highly recommend you check out for your studio. They're going to help you make your best record ever. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you guys in the next episode. Cheers.